Well, good evening, Grace Point family. Glad to have you again for another midweek Bible study over the book of Romans. We'll be finishing up Romans chapter 8 tonight, so grab your Bibles, get them open, and uh, let's get ready to go through Romans chapter 8, at least the second half of it tonight. Uh, Good to have you with us. Good to be with Marcy again. And we're just looking forward to uh, a good discussion tonight of a great chapter in the book of the Bible. Uh, one of the one of the just the the premier um, gospel messages laid out in Romans chapter eight, and so we're going to keep going through that. We got some great verses to talk about here, and uh, we're looking forward to it. So let's start with a word of prayer. Uh, let me open it up, and Marcy will close us out. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time together. Thank you for the chance to um, to open up your Word to uh, to be able to discuss these ideas and how you know we feel about them, but not just how we feel, but how you lead us to follow these verses, how you lead us to understand these verses. Father God, we pray that you'll just, that you will absolutely uh, enlighten our minds and our hearts as we, as we try to figure this out, as we try to understand you more and more and more. We just love you, Father. I pray that you be with the requests that we have uh, from our Bloomfield campus. Father God, we know that there are, there are some people that are dealing with some health issues, uh, uh, and, and that uh, you can you can step in there and, and be with him in that. I think of Todd Shoemaker and Becky Miller. Father God, would you be with them and their uh, the, the the illnesses that they have? Father God, that you'd be with uh, uh, Noel uh, Bales as she's battling some some issues there. Pray pray that you'd be with her, uh, Father God, that you would just continue to to show up in people's lives as they are working through the things that uh, are that they're battling, whether it's health or. Uh, some some mental stuff, the 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 craziness of this time that we're living in, Father God, that you would just you would bless and that you would you would keep people's hearts focused on you, their minds focused on you, so that they can see that you are going through this with each one of us, Father. God, we love you, and we praise you, and we just ask that you bless uh, our families, bless this time, Father. Thank you, Lord. We just thank you for this beautiful day that you've given to us and once again we just thank you that you allow us to come to your word and to learn more about you and that you reveal yourself to us and lord i pray for these um, requests we have um jim near um and candy near you know what's going on all the the information there um lord we pray for connie as she's still um and she'll just continue to bring her um your peace, the peace that passes all understanding. And Lord, we just pray that you just continue to comfort her. And we pray for Patty as she's going in through all these tests, um, that you continue to guide the doctor's hands and in making these determinations and what they're learning in these tests and how best to help. And we just pray that you be with her as she goes through these. And Lord, we just pray for the other requests that um, maybe are unmentioned or um, I haven't heard, be with those situations. And Lord, I just pray that you just continue to have your hand on and guide those in each, the Bloomfield and the Sheraton campus, that you could just continue to keep us safe. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, like I said, guys, we're in Romans chapter 8, uh, starting in verse uh, 18, and then Marcy's going to teach us tonight on this, but we're looking forward to to having you along with us on this. and. I uh, just want to encourage you um, with whatever you're going through. Whatever you're going through, God is with you. Um, if you feel alone, I, I just encourage you to reach out to us, reach out to somebody. Um, if, you, if you're struggling through something, let let us be a part of that, that solution as we walk through this time together. We love you, and we're just glad that you're with us here. So, Marcy, why don't you uh, take us on? So um, this last half of Romans, there's so many good verses in that. And so we're going to kind of try to hit on some of these and kind of highlight some of this stuff. But um, one of the things I was going to say, and you can kind of think of as you go through here, I I would love to know what your guys' favorite verse is out of this part of the chapter um, because there's so many good ones. So just put that comment on YouTube or Facebook or however you're watching this. 
um, if you have a favorite verse through this. So kind of think of that as we go through. Are you, um, you going to give us yours, or are we going to do that at the I end? I will tell you as soon as okay. we come to mine. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I, I, well, then I'll start, because uh, mine's the very first one the we're going to read. The very first one? Yeah. Like, yeah. The, I have always loved verse 18 of chapter 8. And there's other good ones, and, but I, I think verse 18 is my favorite. That one's yours? Okay. Okay. Um, would you like to read... 18 through, let's see, 18 through, what did I have there? Um, yes, through 30, yes. All right, Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 18. This one, this one's my favorite. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For this creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all, who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Yeah, so there we start, you know, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that we would be real revealed in us. It's such a, that's one of those good verses out mm -hmm. of this whole thing. There's quite a few that I have underlined through what you just um, read. But anyway, uh, I wanted to point out that the, the definition of glory um, with the glory uh, that will be revealed into in us. So glory um, in like the Hebrew and in the Greek, it was to like to shine or to have great weight. And in the commentary, Great House talks about how um, it is like almost like what we kind of talk about stars, like there's something about them. Um, and so to glorify or to give glory is really an act of realizing that they have um, glory or a light or a shine. Um, there's something about them. Um, and I thought kind of back through, uh, we kind of describe death as glorification uh, when we alas completely become the image and have the relationship with God that was broken in the garden. Um, and so, <laughs> to, you know, Great House pointed out that really Paul's saying that this are, at this our present sufferings are nothing compared to what will be. This is why this is my favorite verse uh, from this section, uh, and, and one of the one of the great verses of the Bible is because it is it, it gives us that hope, like to acknowledge that we have present sufferings, absolutely. But man, we can make it through anything, mm -hmm. knowing what's coming, mm -hmm. knowing what we will be able to enjoy and experience for all of eternity. That's what makes our present suffering present sufferings manageable or. Uh, we're, we're able to actually make it through them because we know that there is something greater on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, I think that's just so filled with hope in that, mm -hmm. that passage. Yeah. Yeah. So this, this, you know, um, this verse 18 kind of sets us up for verse 19, obviously, um, where he's talking about creation waiting in eager expectations. So he's just talked about how, you know, our present suffering is nothing compared to what will be. And that creation is waiting in eager expectation. And Great House describes it almost as an audience as uh, as an audience on the edge of their seat. So that's what creation mm. 
creation is in waits in eager expectation um, for the children of God to be revealed. Um, and then it goes through, you know, verse 20, um, creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. Um, and we know that that was, you know, through, through, um, that was through the fall, you know. Um, but there in verse 21, uh, that creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay, to, to decay sorry, I can't take talk tonight, and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. And so, um, sorry, I feel like I'm kind of skipping through these, but I want to kind of get us to some of these big um, verses. But um, 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And I, I thought that was an interesting way that Paul puts it in childbirth. Um, and I thought about that, that pains of childbirth, uh, not pains of despair, but pains of joy of what will come with the birth of the new age and new bodies. And, you know, not, not you know, there's something good that will come of this pain, mm -hmm. not just a pain of suffering or a pain of despair. Right. Yeah, it, it ties back into what verse 18 was talking about. There's mm -hmm. something, there's something greater that's coming. Right. Uh, you know, uh, I've never been through childbirth. Paul himself never went through childbirth, but yet we can understand. Um, not We don't understand the pain that is associated with that, but we understand that there is pain, and that, but, that, but that pain is handleable because you're going to get to hold your baby, right? You get to hold this beautiful thing, and, and this beautiful thing is coming for all of us as we go through the present sufferings that we are going through health, um, finances, uh, job stuff, marriage difficulties, all of these things that just create this angst in us, this, this feeling like we're not going to make it through this or we can't make it through this thing. We know that if we just hold on, make it through, whether it's in this life or the next, there is going to be glory to be revealed in us, and we are going to experience that glory, which is going to be amazing. And that's just, it's awesome. So no, ma no matter what you're going through right now, and I know some of you are going through some awful things, there is something coming that's great. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so in um, verse 23, um, one thing I wanted to point out there, uh, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. And I didn't realize this, but I found this out, that that first fruits of the Spirit, so the Feast of Pentecost would have been known as first fruits in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was kind of interesting that, that Pentecost, um, when the Spirit, you know, it goes into that upper room and mm -hmm. Pentecost, like that first fruits. And so I kind of thought it was such an awesome thing for, you know, Paul to say there. And I didn't, I had never really picked up on that. Um, and then verse 24, for in this hope, we are saved. Woo! <laughs> like that's that's good stuff. Right? Sorry, I get excited. Right. Um, yeah. and so I kind of I loved the way uh Great House put this. He said, Hope is future oriented faith. Mm. Oh that's good. That's good. I know. I was just like, that's so it's such a wonderful way to to think about that. Future oriented faith. Um, despite our sufferings, Christians have hope. And I think that that's, the, that's a big deal because so many people in the world, whether it's today or whether it was 2,000 years ago, if it's not happening good for us right now, we're just, we're, we're awful, right? Like, and so as a Christian, and, and, and man, I know it seems like, well, why can't the good stuff be right now? Like, why can't God just, just reach down and make it all right right now, right? God's been around since before creation, Right. Who am I to know the way he wants to govern, the way he wants to rule this earth? For whatever reason, we have to go through, and Paul was clear about it in chapters we've already discussed, that we are going to go through suffering in this world in order to get to the same resurrection as Jesus Christ. And I tell you what, I want the resurrection of Jesus Christ, okay? So I, and, and 
I'm going to suffer until I get there. There's going to be pain on this earth until I get there. But once I get there, it's amazing. It is this hope through which we are saved, right? That's what it says. For in this hope we were saved. Like it's the hope, the hope of the future, the hope of what's to come is what saves us. Because if we're, <laughs> if we're just going to look at our present circumstances and say, yeah, this is good. Like, what are we, like, that's just, there's no hope in, in what we're experiencing right now. The hope is in what's to come. And that hope is what allows us to even say, okay, Jesus, save me so that I can have that. Right? That's, okay. Yeah. And, well, and Paul even says, who hopes for what they already have? Absolutely. Um, but if we hope for what we do not have yet, we wait for it patiently. Mm. Like it's, we wait for it patiently, knowing that this is the outcome. And Paul go on, continue to talk on, you know, through the end of this chapter. But we know the outcome. Like we know the outcome, so we can wait patiently, having this hope. I think he's kind of a jerk for throwing that word in there, patiently. <laughs> but whatever, Paul. Like I, but it's true. Like that's, um, who are we to be able to say it should be done in my timing, right? Mm-hmm. We know it's God's timing, God's will, God's way. So we know it's coming. We have faith and it's coming. <sighs> Relax, breathe, wait on the Lord. Yeah, that's good. So, and then I know, um, you know, quite a few people kind of like these um, next couple of verses. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Mm -hmm. Um, I just, I love that, like that, that idea that even when, you know, I don't know what to say, even if I don't, you know, you know, we always kind of pray, you know, God heal this person or you know but when we're at that point where we don't even know what to ask for Mm -hmm. that the holy spirit knows our hearts and knows our mind and is able to you know to to intercede that and to talk to god for us and know what it is that we we're wanting Mm -hmm. even if it's just that comfort through that whole situation and it's such a you know, a good thing to know that the Spirit's there to help us. Yeah, it's just that that's that connection we have with God mm-hmm. through the power of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit shows up. He uh, he's enters into us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior. So God himself is actually inside of us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he knows us, and the Spirit knows God. And so there's this connection. And so what we... In our humanness, we can know something's wrong. We can know something's off. God, I don't know how to fix this. God, I don't know how to make this right. I don't know how to. I don't know. I don't know how to do what you're asking me to do. And the Spirit can take that, that the the the, the Spirit of what we're feeling. Like He can take that 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 attitude, that that desire for rightness, and take that before the throne of God and say. <laughs> Your child is is desperate for you. He needs you. She needs you. Show up. And God does. He does. Mm-hmm. And so um, another, another one, another good verse. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Um, and then to go on. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And so I want to um, kind of touch just a little bit um, there on, you know, according to his purpose and predestined to what? And Paul kind of talks about it right there, to be conformed to the image of his son. Uh, to be con- this Christ likeness, um, it's still our choice. Um, it might, you know, it's what God wants, um, but it's still our choice. And really, this predestined here is the plans for the community of believers. So the church. So I know, you know, we kind of read predestined in our Bibles and kind of go, 
ooh, sometimes we get a little, ooh. <laughs> and so, um, but I wanted to point out that this is the plans for the community of believers, the church, which is to be conformed to the image of Jesus. Well, I tell you, that's so important because uh, as Americans, what we really struggle with is individualism. We, we read the Bible and we say, this is about me. This is what I need to do. And there's some truth. There, there are some points in the Bible where it is about you. There's things you need to change. There's things I need to change. The Bible points that out to us. But the relationship that we have with, with God through Jesus Christ is meant to be had in community. So, so many of the instructions of God, this being one of them, is that this, this thing of being predestined, and he's going to talk about the elect and that kind of stuff, and, and being this, this foreknowledge of what he wants or what he knows is going to happen, that is for his body of belief, the body of people that make up the body of Jesus Christ here on earth. That is what we are predestined to be, to be the body, to be Jesus to the world. And that's, that's what he's getting at. And so I need you, you need me, we need you. All of us are in this thing together so that we can be the image of Christ. We get, that, get, that takes us back to Genesis where, you know, the, the whole idea of, of the helpmate being, being brought uh, into play. So there's Adam and then God makes Eve. And God says it's in his image that he created them. You don't get the image of God with just Adam. Right? You don't get the image of God with just the one. You need the other. And it's the same. And you can take that for man and woman together. That's why the marriage is the is the is the um the what's the word I'm looking for? The shadow or the 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 reflection of what it is to be in relationship with God. There's there's this marriage idea of bringing together to become one. The two shall become one. It's the same thing as the body of believers. Like we can't be a body if it's just me. We need everybody in this to show the image of God. The image of God is is visible in me, but it's not complete in just me, right? And it's not complete in just you and I sitting here together. It is complete when all of us that are in a community together are working together for his purpose, mm -hmm. his predestined purpose. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a reason why, you know, they the church is is talked about as the body of Christ and we all come together and and serve those purposes and it's got to be cuz you know when certain if we lose you know people from our community we lose that part of the body yep. um that's and it really the whole body suffers from that yeah when so y someone has left your church whether on good good grounds or or bad you know bad grounds whatever it is it's it's painful it, there's 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 real hurt in that because you're ripping apart part of the body mm -hmm. and so that's 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 a real thing that we deal with and because the image of God is not complete without the whole body being together mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so um, I wanted to kind of bring up this this quote uh, from Great House and kind of a, a summing up um, kind of some things that we've talked about so far um, and I kind of, it's not a full quote. I kind of uh, grabbed some of it. Otherwise, it would have been a lot longer. He said, from the vantage point of eternity, all things that come to Christians in this life, even the suffering of this present age, somehow serve God's purpose. Mm -hmm. So we talked about the present sufferings in eight, verse 18, the frustrations in verse 20, the t deteriorating and dying bodies in verse 12 and or I mean 21 and 23 the groaning and waiting in verses 23 the disciplined perseverance of verse 25 our weakness in verse 26 the difficulty praying in verse 26 and 27 um, that all would seem to hinder God's purpose for us but in fact everything that seems to frustrate God's purpose comes to serve its accomplishment. As a result, nothing can ultimately harm the Christian. Even the full onslaught of the powers of destruction, as we'll see in the following verses, that they too contribute to God's good purpose for those who love him. That's so good because that's like, I've taught this verse before in a, in a Bible study setting and someone raised their hand and said, 
my my niece just had a miscarriage, right? I can still see the person sitting there crying before they could even start asking me the question, why? Why? How does that how does that bring about God's goodwill? And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. Like, how is that good? I, I and I don't have an answer for that, but all I know is that it's a promise from God that that he will use what has happened. Like it, this verse does not say that God causes bad things to happen so that he can bring about his will. What God is saying is that he will use whatever happens. So because we live in a fallen world and there's sin and there's disease and sickness and death that we don't have control over, that he will use what happens to bring about good at some point. It could be soon. It could be later. It could be in glory when that finally happens. But we have a promise from him that he will use that for his good somewhere, some way, somehow. And it's our I don't even want to say duty because that seems wrong, but it's, it, is, it is up to us then to trust him. It is up to us to trust that God really is going to do what he said he's going to do, which is to work for the good of those who love him. And that's according to his purpose and plan, right? That's according to his way. So he can see the big picture. Like I can't, I can't see... I, I can barely see what's going to happen, you know, four hours from now. I might be asleep. I might still be, you know, doing something. God knows what's going to, what's going to happen 20 years ago. He knows what, what he wants to have happen, and he's going to start working things out. As things happen, he kind of uh, helps us to see how we can navigate through those waters and be able to come out on the other side with him going with us the whole way. That's where the goodness comes from is he's with us every step of the way. It's not always a good outcome, a good feeling outcome. But the goodness is that he's with us and he can help us see him and his goodness and his promises and the hope for the future that we can have in him as we're going through those sufferings and frustrations and the dying bodies and all those things you listed out. Like, that's so good. I'm sorry I'm talking too much. But that's, 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 such, that's so good that we understand that we don't have to understand the awful things that happen. But we can trust that God will use what has happened to bring about good for those who love him. And the challenge then is to, to have those things happen and continue to love him. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's, that's the challenge. And I'm not saying it's easy. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying it's easy. It, it, it's so hard. Mm-hmm. But back to verse 18, our present sufferings do not compare to what is to come. Mm-hmm. I, I, I hope you can hold on to that today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember um, giving a sermon here in Sheraton about trusting the heart of God mm-hmm. and trusting God with our heart, even when you know we feel we've gone through some terrible things. Um, to trust that He will take that what we give to Him, this brokenness that we give to Him, out of this terrible these terrible things that happen in our life, and bring about good from that. And I know a lot of times we go, how can that be good? How can he work that to be good? But the thing is, is we don't have to understand that. We just have to trust that he Mm -hmm. will work it to good. And like you said, we might not see it right away, and we might not see it here, but we just have to trust that he works all things for good, his good, um, for the God's good purpose for those who love him. Yeah. Yep. yep. Um, and then I wanted to point out there, too, um, that love. Um, uh, where was it? That, that love him. Um, for those who love him. That's that agape, once again, that um, agape love that we have for God. So um, then... In verse 30, so we've got this, Paul goes through, and those he he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Um, Those he called, he also justified, like because they responded in faith to the call, Mm -hmm. those he justified, he also glorified. And uh, I was just going to say, so again, just to reiterate that, that those he predestined, 
is not just him picking and choosing who's going to be who he's going to save, right? That's still up to us. Each one of us has our own free will to decide on that. Those he predestined means the church. Those who have, those he predestined, those he um, chose, meaning he's chosen the church to do his work. And so if you will choose to be a part of the church, you are part of those he predestined to call, to then call, mm-hmm. because you've accepted the call. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then it goes on from there, which you pointed out, which is great. I just, yeah. that predestined people, like you said before, people can get hung up on that. Mm-hmm. Well, so being predestined means just be choosing to be a part of the church. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not like he, he has already gone through and goes, this person, not this person. Right. Like, we still have that free will. We still have that choice to be a part of that. Yes. Um, and then, so there, uh, those, he, he, those he justified, he also glorified. And I thought that was such a great thing because Paul brings us back, back to this meaning of glory to realize that there's something about them. We are adopted in and are being brought into the image, yeah. um, like we talked about earlier, the glorification. Yeah. So. I thought that was a wonderful, like how Paul did that, and hadn't even really thought about that until I read through it today, and kind of point, like, came out at me, and I went, "Whoa, that was that was so cool." How Paul does that. So uh, let's go ahead and now read uh, verses thirty-one through thirty-nine. Verse thirty-one: What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't know about you, but that part just pumps me up. Yeah. Like, it just pumps me up. Oh, man. Well, the problem I have is is uh, that verse is a VBS song from a couple years back. And so anytime I say it, like, I want to say it like I'm like a like a southern black preacher, like getting like neither height nor depth nor anything. <laughs> and I want to get there, but then all of a sudden all I hear is little kids singing the song in my head. And so... That gets me all messed up, but I get what you're saying completely. I know. I can just imagine, you know, Paul trying to, like, get this out and just, you know, really yeah. ramping up through all His of His handwriting's it. getting worse because <laughs> he's writing faster and faster. Yeah. yeah. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Yeah. Like, uh, it's another one of those Paul rhetorical questions. Um, if the one... True, and this is a great house quote out of the thing, uh, out of the commentary. If the one true God, the creator, is on our side, what possible difference does human opposition make? Amen. Period. Like, <laughs> Amen. that's exactly what Paul's saying there. Like, if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. Like, such a good, that's another good verse. Not my favorite, but such a good one. <laughs> We're getting closer to my favorite one. Um, So then, verse 32, uh, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. And I want to point it out there that it says, gave him up for us all, Jews and Gentiles. We got to remember who Paul was writing to. Um, we already went through the chapters where he talks about Jews and Gentiles all, you know, us all being grafted in into, you know, God's people. Um, so it's for us all. And once again, he's pulling that out there and saying, for us all, we all have this choice. 
I, 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 you know, I, that's so hard because there, there are so many people that, um, that can, that, that can read a lot of the Bible and, and see themselves in some parts and realize that maybe that's for them, that's for somebody else, that's for, you know, and we've talked before about, you know, the Jews, we as Gentiles are grafted into that. Um, and the, but it is true, like, for God so loved the world, right, that he gave us, it's that God so loved Israel, for God so loved the world. Um, this whole thing, and Paul, absolutely, his audience is the Roman church, which is a bunch of Gentiles and a few Jews sprinkled in here and there. And these Jews that are actually now called part of the way, right? Not they aren't they aren't necessarily Christians yet. They're Christ followers, but they're followers of the way. Um, and and man, that's just such a good thing to realize that God opened the door for everybody because of Jesus Christ. And Paul just throughout all of his writings just acknowledges that over. And Paul's the Jewest of Jews, right? So like he, if, if there's anybody that's going to say, and he tried for a long time to say, no, Jewish way is right. Jesus is not the Messiah. And then God opened his eyes and he realized that the door was open to everybody. And now he's gone on and just made it his life's work to make the Gentiles understand. And in the process, tell the Jews that the Gentiles are into. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, just to finish that up, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? And then continuing on, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Um, it is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who is raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also in also is also interceding for us. And so in there in um, some versions they'll say God's elect, um, which in the Old Testament it meant Israel. Uh, but here it's all Christians, yep. Jews and Gentiles. Mm -hmm. um, Paul is saying uh, the one who justifies sinners would never bring charges against those he had already acquitted, basically. Yeah, and, and to, to that point, too, we can think that people bring char people bring charges against us. Um, they can accuse us of, of a lot of different things. But the reality is, again, it doesn't uh, – we're, we're to live at peace with people, but we understand that, that Jesus is the one who has saved us through his death and resurrection. And so because of that – it doesn't matter if there's any charges brought to us. They mean nothing in light of Jesus' acquittal of us. Right. So, yeah. right. right. So if, he, if God's already justified, already acquitted us of mm -hmm. those charges, then, you know, we kind of go back. If God is for us, who can be against us? Yep, yep. Um, if we've already been acquitted of those, then what can they hold against us? Um, so then we go into... Um, Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And, you know, um, in the commentary, uh, Great House mentions that we can modernize this list. Like, um, so who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or cancer or terrorism or Alzheimer's. What? Um, Paul's essential point. Coronavirus. Yeah, coronavirus. Paul's essential point is is that not a, imaginable suffering, not even death itself, can deprive us of the certainty that Christ loves us. We're all going to get sick. We're all go we're, we're going to meet an end somehow, right? Whether it's sickness, whether it's d car accident whether it is dying peacefully in, in old age, you are going to meet your end. Death is coming. None of that should scare you as a follower of Jesus Christ. We can be, we can be worried about feeling pain. We can be worried like that's no one wants it, but like the idea of death should, should not scare you. And if it does, pray. Ask God for peace when it comes to that so that you can know that when your time is going to come, you can face that next step. Again, your life is not ending. Your life is continuing on with Jesus. 
in the presence of God for the rest of eternity. That's an, that's an amazing thing. So death coming, hardship, sickness, Alzheimer's, cancer, whatever it is, God still brings hope through Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, what can separate us from the love of Christ? And Paul goes on, and that's, um, we're going to, I'll say this, the end of this. So ver- verse 36, as is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And so Paul, the, the next verse in 37, he addresses these things. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That's my favorite verse right there. <laughs> no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. So, and here's the, here's the beautiful thing about that. And so I'm going to, uh, hopefully, if, if I start going too long, just throw something mm-hmm. at me. Because I, cause these three verses, that 35, 36, and 37, tie in together. So 35, he lists out those things. So and we, we, we added to that list, cancer, Alzheimer's, coronavirus, what, hit by a car. Whatever it is that is going to cause suffering, that's going to bring pain, right? Paul says uh, that is the, the lot of this world. He says, and he's quoting from uh, David in the Psalms. He says, for your sake we face death all day long. David say, is saying this. He's writing this in the Psalms. For your sake, we face death all day long. Like, we literally face death every time we walk out the door. We, we face death all the time. Our next breath could be our last, right? We face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. We will die. We are going to die. We are going to be brought to the slaughterhouse, and we will. our life will end. Does it matter? He answers it in verse 37. No, because we are more than conquerors. Does that mean we're not going to face death? Does that mean we're going to have victory over cancer uh, 100% of the time? Does that mean we're going to have victory over uh, getting hit by a car? Does that mean we're going to have victory over uh, job loss and all the different things that you can put in there for, for hardship? No, we are conquerors because we get hope to face eternity, and we will have that hope into eternity when we, when we have glory with Jesus Christ for all of time. We are more than conquerors, not because it's going to work out perfectly on this earth, but because it will work out perfectly when we leave this earth. Amen. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. No, in all these things, we are more than yeah. conquerors. You got to, you got, when you read it, you got to shout the no. Yeah. You have to, I mean, you have to, so, uh, yeah. That's one, of, that's one of my favorite verses because, I, you know, I, I know I've shared with you, like, I have n- not really ever won a whole lot of things. And then to be more than a conqueror in you anything. Got, you got Adam. I did. I did. I won the lottery on that <laughs> one. <laughs> I, I'm meaning like a competition kind of thing. And I understand that these aren't really competitions. and that's But, like, to think, like, God loves me through yeah. all these things. There's, n- you know, and as he's going to point out there, there's nothing that's going to separate me right. from his love. We are more than conquerors uh, through him who loved us. Like, man, that just that just hits me in all the feels. I mean, it does. And so um, I want to bring up this quote, too, there from uh, Great House. He says, Suffering does not threaten to undermine our experience of the love Christ has for us. We suffer, but we conquer nonetheless. Amen. Amen. Mm. Just that, that's, that is one of my, fa- that's like my favorite verse <laughs> right there. So, <sighs> now, going on, because Paul's still ramped up. Yep. Paul's still, um, for I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. He's got this, you know, polar opposite um, reali- list of realities, uh, death or life demons or angels, presence or future, height nor debt, 
nor anything else in all creation. Just to cover his basis, he says, nor anything else in all creation. So he's saying nothing whatsoever can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Oh, man, that's yeah. a good verse. Yep. That's a good verse, too. So I wouldn't be surprised if other people have that one as their <laughs> favorite. Yeah, absolutely. So um, basically, it says nothing can exclude us from final salvation because it finally depends on him and not us. We have to make that choice. Um, but that is it. That whole thing depends on him. Yeah. Once once we make the choice, and, and it is. I mean, and it's a and don't don't confuse this. It's a daily choice. Uh, Jesus himself said, "You have to take up your cross daily, not just one time, and you're set for life. Take up your cro- cross daily and follow him. And if we do that, whew, again, that doesn't mean perfection. That doesn't mean." That doesn't mean things won't be hard. That doesn't mean you won't fail sometimes. But if you will take up your cross and follow Jesus, nothing separates you from God. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So I kind of wanted to um, end us on this great house quote, and then I guess we'll kind of discuss on the the thought that we want to leave people with. Um, But it was just such a really good quote from Great House, and I just had to put it in here. It says, the decisive battle has already been won. The death and the resurrection of our Lord. None of the lingering insurgent forces resist the new regime. Despite their disruptive power, can separate us from God's love or hinder us from ultimately sharing in the lordship of the universe he won on our behalf. It is finished, to quote the great Bill Gaither. It is finished. And Bill Gaither was quoting Jesus, to be <laughs> to be clear. So, but it is finished. Right. The battle has already been won. Yeah. The death and resurrection of our Lord. None of the lingering insurgent forces resist. It's, I mean, it's, <sighs> the devil is working, okay, and, and we can fall. We can we can we can refuse to take up our cross mm-hmm. and follow Jesus. And the devil can get that foothold in there, and we can start to see. But that's that's us. That's not anything in the world that's that's getting to us. That's us not letting the power of the Spirit work in us to have victory over all those stupid things. Guys, let the power of the Holy Spirit move you to victory. Get out of your own way. And just rely on the Spirit and the Word of God instructing you to have victory in your life over the things that you struggle with. I, I need that lesson, right? So many different times. I still battle with, with different things. I need that lesson to know that God has won the victory. Already won it. And when I fail, that was my choice. And I can choose next time to live following his spirit so that it leads me to victory. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, even when we, we make those, those choices that are bad, um, we can still acknowledge that and say, okay, yes, that was bad. But God still loves us. Mm-hmm. Like, we still are able to come back to him and say, yes. I'm so sorry. Like, I please help me mm-hmm. in, you know, doing this better next time. Please continue to make me sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit so that I can, you know, I can do this r- the right way, the way you want me to, to go, the path you want me to go on. Even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Christ died for you and for me. And so I want you to think about the, and I don't know what you've got for a final thought, but just whatever you, whatever makes you feel the lowest in this life. And I, 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 I think about that verse, even while we were still sinners, Christ died. So when you were doing the, the thing that makes you sick to your stomach about your life, when you were in the middle of doing something that, that man, you wish nobody knew about, that's when Jesus met you and was with you 
and was willing to die for you, not once you've got it all right and figured out. But his love is so with you that even in your lowest moment, when you, when I don't want people to know about the things that I've done, Jesus chose that moment to say, I still love you enough to die for you. Mm-hmm. Nothing can separate us from the love of mm-hmm. God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yep. Amen. Not anything else in all mm. creation. Oh, good stuff. Right, right. So I don't... Um, I'm going to let you come up with a final thought here for, I mean, I know you just kind of talked about that, but is there something, you know, after going through all this, um, is there something that we really need to be concentrating on this week um, that was written in this that maybe you can think of? I would, I mean, I would point us back to that, that idea of what, what hardship are you going through? What, what, what trouble is finding you in this world like what what is outside of your control seemingly like is it health is it is it money right is it is it job stuff is it is it uh, are you considering divorce are you uh, having trouble with a, a a child or a grandchild they don't want to listen you can't figure out how to how to get them to 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 to, to obey whatever struggle you are facing depression anxiety Whatever, whatever thing that is the devil is trying to use to get to you, that is not possible to get in the way of God's love for you. So whatever it is, it's real. It's a present suffering, right? So to go back to verse 18, it is a present suffering that does not compare to the glorious riches that are in Jesus Christ. So whatever it is that you are suffering through, suffer, waiting patiently for glory to come to you because it's coming. I promise, and I only promise that because God himself, through his word, promised it to us. So think on those things. What are you suffering through? Give it to God and let him walk with you through that thing. Amen. Amen. Let him use it for the good. He, yeah, exactly. Yeah, to tie that. Yeah, Let he will use it for your good. Yeah. You may not see it. You may not see it till after the good has come, and you're like, "What just happened? That was awful." And then all of a sudden, it wasn't. All of a sudden, it made sense. All of a sudden, it clicked, and God revealed Himself to you even more. How much He loves you. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Mm-hmm. Why don't you? Close us in prayer, then Marcy. Okay. Lord, we just are so thankful that nothing can separate us from your love. And Lord, I just I just thank you for continuing to to point that out to us that you love us so much and you want us to come in and to to lean into you and to trust you that you will work things for our for your good. And Lord, as we start to let go of some of these broken pieces and we give them to you, Lord, I pray that maybe to those that haven't let go of some of these brokenness before, that you will begin to reveal the good that's coming out of that. Because I know in going through and seeing you work in my life, that has strengthened my trust in you and your promises to see that happening. And Lord, I know that we have faith in that before we see that. Lord, I just thank you for this time we've, you've given to us to learn more about you and for you to reveal yourself to us. And Lord, we just thank you for this writing, these writings that we're able to, to read and to learn from. Lord, I just pray that you open up our hearts and our minds to what it is that we need to concentrate on from this lesson this week and just continue to start bringing it to the forefront. Lord, I just thank you for that. I just thank you that you do that for us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.